sense, contextually. He argues Jesus was an apocalypticist because of contextual credibility. He argues that the title, the Son of Man, is an authentic expression used by Jesus because it is contextually credible. And he argues that Jesus was an exorcist because that's contextually credible. Those are all proper use of the criterion, positive arguments on the basis of the criterion. But you remember, that wasn't the way he stated the criterion. He stated the criterion negatively to say that if something wasn't contextually credible, then it was unhistorical. So here, ironically, he winds up using the criterion correctly, positively, uh, because he abandons his own misstatement of it. So I think you can see that when you look at Ehrman's statement of and use of the criteria, this is really a disaster. It, it's really an embarrassment that a New Testament scholar should be this sloppy. Now let's look specifically at Jesus' claim to be the Son of Man. And we saw that Ehrman does agree that Jesus used the title, the Son of Man, as a self-designation. And this is extremely important because by using the title, the Son of Man, Jesus is alluding to that divine human figure prophesied by Daniel to whom God would give all authority and judgment over all the kingdoms of the earth, that all the peoples of the earth should worship and serve him. So Jesus' claim to be the Son of Man is, is dynamite theologically because it shows Jesus' divine human self-consciousness and understanding. How does Ehrman regard the title Son of Man? He thinks Jesus did claim to be, or, or rather he didn't, he, he believed Jesus did use the title the Son of Man. But he didn't think Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man because he thought Jesus was referring to somebody else. So that when he predicted the Son of Man will come and, and do this or that, he was talking about another person. Now this is a bizarre uh, interpretation of the title which was held by Rudolf Bultmann back in the mid-20th century and which was influential at that time in Germany. But it's no longer a widely held view. I asked several of my New Testament colleagues about this. Can you think of anybody who thinks that Jesus used the title, the Son of Man, to refer to somebody else other than himself? They couldn't even think of any other contemporary scholar that holds to this view. Well, why not? Why are so few persuaded by this Boltmannian view? Well, first of all, there's no good evidence for this interpretation. Ehrman's only proof of this interpretation is Jesus saying in Mark 8:38, whoever is ashamed of me, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him. Whoever is ashamed of me, Jesus, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him. And Ehrman says we could take this to mean that if you're ashamed of Jesus, then the Son of Man, whoever he is, will also be ashamed of you, somebody other than Jesus. Well, yeah, you could take it that way, but there's no reason that you should. In fact, that seems an extremely contrived interpretation. And that leads me to my second point. There are good reasons to reject this interpretation. First of all, first point, over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. This is Jesus' favorite self-designation in the Gospel. Some 80 times he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Dr. Ehrman's view would require that all of these statements of self-reference by Jesus are inauthentic, that these are creations of the early Christian church. But here he faces a huge problem. The title, The Son of Man, appears only once in the New Testament outside the Gospels. One time in the book of Acts, it's applied to Jesus. Now, what that shows is that this title was not a title that was widely used in the New Testament church for Jesus. So, by the strictest use of the criterion of dissimilarity, it must belong to the historical Jesus. This was evidently a title that Jesus used of himself, but which didn't 
catch on in the early church and soon dropped out of use. So, by the criterion of dissimilarity, we have very powerful grounds for thinking Jesus used this title as a self-designation. Number two, there are authentic Son of Man sayings which clearly refer to Jesus. There are specific Son of Man sayings that clearly refer to Jesus. Let me mention three of them. Number one, Jesus saying in Mark, uh, or rather Matthew 8.20, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now obviously the Son of Man in this saying is not referring to some future coming cosmic king. And incredibly, Dr. Ehrman himself on page 31 of part two of his lectures on the historical Jesus agrees that this is an authentic saying of the historical Jesus. So clearly Jesus did think of himself as the Son of Man and Ehrman admits this saying is authentic. Second example, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 25. Jesus tells his disciples, in the renewed world, you shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Dr. Ehrman himself accepts this as a historically authentic saying of the historical Jesus. But this raises a very interesting question. If the disciples will sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, who's going to be the king over all of Israel? Well, Dr. Ehrman answers unhesitatingly, Jesus, Jesus himself. He says, and I quote, the earliest traditions indicate that Jesus thought he would be enthroned. Jesus would rule over the disciples. So Jesus will be the king of Israel over the disciples who are on the 12 uh, thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But look at what the full text of Matthew 19, 28 says. In the renewed world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall also sit upon the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is a Son of Man saying in which Jesus is calling himself the Son of Man who will be the King of Israel. So Ehrman himself is committed to saying, in this saying, Jesus uses it as a self-designation. Third example, in Jesus' trial scene before the high priest, Dr. Ehrman cannot make sense out of Jesus' condemnation by the Sanhedrin. You remember at the trial, the high priest asks Jesus, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus responds, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest rips his garment and says, blasphemy, and the council all unanimously votes to condemn Jesus to death as a blasphemer. Now, since Dr. Ehrman takes Jesus to be referring to somebody else when he says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, etc., he can't make any sense of why the Sanhedrin condemns Jesus for blasphemy. He writes, it is difficult to understand the trial because the charge of blasphemy cannot be rooted in anything Jesus said. It wasn't blasphemous to call oneself the Messiah, nor to say that the Son of Man was soon to arrive, yet the high priest accused Jesus of blasphemy. <laughs> so Dr. Ehrman's view cannot make sense of Jesus' death, which violates one of the basic criteria of authenticity, uh, namely that you've got to have a view that coheres with what is firmly established about Jesus, like his crucifixion. By contrast, if Jesus did identify himself as the Son of Man, then everything falls into place. And Dr. Ehrman admits this. He says, one could conceive of his statement as blasphemous only by assuming that Jesus was the Son of Man. Because then, Jesus would be saying that he had a standing equal with God. Right. Right. 
So, again, there are specific Son of Man sayings that show very clearly that Jesus wasn't talking about somebody else. He was talking about himself. That's my second point. My third point, by way of criticism, is that Dr. Ehrman's view cannot make sense of Jesus' claim to ultimate authority. There's something of a consensus among New Testament scholars that Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene with an unsurpassed sense of authority. Ehrman himself recognizes that Jesus thought that people's fate ultimately hinged upon their response to him and that he thought they would be judged before the Son of Man on the basis of their response to Jesus and that Jesus thought that he would be the king in the kingdom of God. He put himself in God's place by his words and actions. 